This is a return visit for my next guest, the internationally recognized writer, contributing editor at National Affairs. James uh, Polos is also author of a new book, The Art of Being Free, How Alexis de Tocqueville Can Save Us from Ourselves, which is a bit of his departure from the political beat. The book comes out on the 17th of this month, but is available for pre-orders now. He joins me here in studio. We'll get a lot into the book a little later, but you said it's not about politics. There's but I little... understand it covers things like reconciling religious beliefs with our political system, keeping up with the pace of change, right? That's right. All the stuff that you have to worry about before you can even start to ask some of those political questions. Uh, you know, obviously it's a crazy time right now. I wanted to take a look at why American life is kind of inherently crazy. What's baked into the structure of our lives uh, that makes politics just aggravate those feelings that we already bring to the table. Is crazy the correct word? Oh, I think it's, it's the best one that I could come up with to kind of capture what's going on. You know, the anxiety, the confusion, we're pressured by change, we're feeling more insignificant and interchangeable than we have in the past, social links are coming apart, we're being hacked. trusted institutions are weakening, Nothing we're being hacked. Private. That's right, there's a lot of uncertainty in the air, and, uh, and it's not the kind that comes with that sort of warm and fuzzy hope where you can't wait to see what's around the corner. I'll ask you later what de Tocqueville would have thought of this today, but a couple of other things. You've covered politics and current affairs for years. Why is suddenly Obama almost at 60 percent popularity? Well, I think people don't want to step fully into this mode of complete uncertainty. Uh, and there's, you know, that's understandable considering how much even Obama has left uncertain. Technology's changed the way security works. It's changed the way finance works. Uh, it's not clear whether the balance of the economy is going to shift more towards Silicon Valley and whether it's going to go toward sort of apps for everything or something more concrete, like what guys like Peter Thiel or Elon Musk are offering. Uh, and so, you know, Obama did manage to save uh, the economy from oblivion, and that's great. But what do you do for an encore? That's well, the we question. We like his oratory, right? Oh, He's sure. You know, he was a nice guy to listen to. Uh, then He's the question that, that Trump has to answer is, is now what? Uh, and uh, that's going to be a tough question to face up to, but people need to face up to it in their own lives. That's something they're also hesitant to do something. What did Obama fail at? Oh, gosh. I mean, I think Syria is right up there on the top of the list. Uh, and as far as, as technologies change uh, as concerning finance and concerning security, those are big problems, uh, whether it's the hacking or whether it's, uh, you know, Wall Street being more concentrated, more powerful in some ways than before the financial crisis. Uh, those are structural problems uh, that the Trump administration is going to have to solve if Trump wants to be a success. Change is the only constant, right? Oh, changes everywhere you look. Uh, so why don't we like it? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question because oftentimes we will pay for change. I think what happened is we got stuck with change uh, of a greater magnitude than we could have imagined. Um, and as the, the old ways of life start to break down, and this is something that's straight out of Tocqueville, as those structures from the aristocratic era, you know, church authority and uh, uh, family bloodlines that go on for hundreds of years, all that kind of stuff. As that goes away, there's this explosion of optimism, and you saw it at the beginning of the American Revolution and even the French Revolution for a bit. People think all the old boundaries have been knocked down, we've got clear sailing, manifest destiny, all that kind of stuff. Um, and what happens, Tocqueville suggests, is once the dust settles, people look around and realize that there are these invisible boundaries that have sprung up. Suddenly, everyone's competing against everyone else. Suddenly, we're competing to conform, to, to try to be just like everyone else, only a little bit better. And this is something that people like Peter Thiel have remarked on as well. So if you're concerned about what Donald Trump's going to do in the future, uh, I think there's reason to feel uh, like we're on more of a clearly defined track than it might seem, given the influence that guys like Thiel have on the administration. And it's almost like nothing shocking anymore. You blow up a bank, you blow up a market. Germany has this, they shoot an ambassador, right? That's right. We've come to expect the, norm. the unexpected. <clears throat> They're clearing uh, the airport today at LAX. That's right. Um, and, and we're hesitant to talk about why we're being locked into these patterns. Uh, some of it is uh, geopolitics, some of it is economics. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the self-fulfilling prophecy of thinking that everything's spinning out of control. You know, uh, St. Augustine said, we are the times. You know, it, it's on us. And if we lose our nerve before things really get bad, and they've gotten real bad in the past, worse than they are now for sure. If we lose our nerves now, now we're guaranteeing that we're going to live in a less free world. As Pogo said, we have met the enemy and it is us. 
oh, well, there, you know, there's, uh, there's the us that we walk around with every day. There's the us that stares us in the face when we're home alone at night. Uh, there's the us that we try to shoot out into the world when we uh, dive into social media to distract ourselves from, from reality and from our thoughts. Uh, the self is this shifting creation. Uh, people want to try to hang some certainty and focus on it, and the self is stubborn. It doesn't want to do that. I mean, read Hamlet, and you, you find out the same thing. <laughs> you wrote this. To face perhaps the biggest domestic test of his presidency, Donald Trump needs to rebalance our economic leadership away from the intangible, bubble-prone worlds of speculative finance and apps for everything toward concrete investment production and innovation that can make the future great again. Do you think he can do that? I think he might. I think he has it in him. Uh, we'll see how it shakes out. But really, my prayers were answered when he uh, managed to get Elon Musk onto his uh, business advisory council. Peter Thiel's also exercising some influence. Uh, people have some discomfort with these tech titans taking on such a pronounced role in politics. But look at the alternative. Uh, you know, these are guys who understand that if your economy is being propped up by people making wild bets on the value of currency, uh, people um, on Wall Street who are trying to just outrace the competition by milliseconds in order to place big bets. Uh, that's a very unstable way of trying to get the economy out of the post-2008 world. Uh, a better option is by making um, a concerted effort to reform infrastructure in a way that will make us more energy independent and also give us a surplus of energy. You know, that means stuff like more solar power, that means stuff like more nuclear power, that means stuff like uh, changing the way that our transportation infrastructure works. Uh, and it's going to take an adjustment, but if we don't make that adjustment, uh, we're going to find ourselves on the losing end of the next four to eight years. What do you think of his reliance on Twitter? Um, I think it tells you uh, much of what you need to know about how Donald Trump works, uh, for good and for ill. Um, everyone relies on Twitter probably more than they thought they would when they first started out, uh, except for the handful of people who have bailed. I don't think Donald Trump's going to bail anytime soon, uh, and I think it's a reminder um, that, uh, that social media can de-link us from the real world and distract us from the face-to-face -face relationships that we need to have true freedom, but that it's also something that we're stuck with. Uh, you know, Twitter is not going away, and it, even if it fails as a business, it'll just be sold off to some more successful business. Okay, let's get into the book. The title, The Art of Being Free, How Alexis de Tocqueville Can Save Us From Ourselves. Who was Alexis de Tocqueville? A uh, French aristocrat, but a liberal. Um, he uh, was writing his books in the, the family compound in Normandy, looking across the English Channel where his ancestors uh, invaded England. And what did he write about? What are uh, his other books? So he wrote another book on the old regime and the revolution uh, after um, the, the, some of the dust had settled from the French Revolution. He also wrote a book on uh, another, yet another revolution that the French had in 1848. Uh, he was concerned about how Europe was going to democratize poorly uh, and that there were lessons to learn in the United States for about how to democratize well. So when did he come to the United States? Uh, he was here and then returned to France to write Democracy in America, uh, the tail end of the 1830s into the 1840s. And was that a big bestseller? Uh, John Stuart Mill hailed uh, the first volume. It's a two-volume book that's usually sold in, in, in one volume now. Uh, Mill hailed it as one of the greatest books of its time. Uh, you know, there was a, there was a group of, of uh, aristocrats who were still liberals uh, who thought that Tocqueville had really cracked the code. Uh, in fact, Tocqueville's wisdom, I would suggest, uh, outlived that aristocratic liberalism, and Tocqueville knew that it would, uh, which is one reason why, uh, in spite of the fact that this is, you know, a guy from a bygone era um, who's not even an American, uh, his insights and uh, the, the pattern of thinking that he teases out of American life is still so powerful for us. He was here originally to write about one area, right? Uh, he was here with a, a close friend of his to uh, ostensibly to write on the prison system. The prison, uh, right, yeah. Part, part of the goal, honestly, was just to get out of France. Uh, things were getting <laughs> a little bit too hot politically, uh, and that, that seemed like a, a ticket out is uh, to spend some time in America. You know, he wasn't just backpacking his way through the country, though. Uh, he was sitting down with, uh, you know, John Quincy Adams, with high-placed members of society and business. He really got the inside scoop, and that's not something that's immediately obvious when you read the book. At the beginning of the book, you give a how-to guide for reading it, right? That's right. Why do we need that? Oh, I think, you know, the average person today uh, has not enough time to do what they want, much less, you know, do something that seems like eating their vegetables. And you just have to accept that uh, a book like Democracy in America, something that's not widely taught in schools, 
uh, something that hasn't been drummed into our head from, from day one, can be, uh, can be a little daunting uh, to someone who feels like they don't have enough time to work, they don't have enough time to play, they only have time for the best. Uh, this book is that kind of book, uh, but you do need to understand that what you're doing is you're taking a deep dive into the American character. And if you understand that, then I think it'll power you through. Is being free an art? It is. Uh, the art of being free is actually a line ripped straight out of democracy in America. Uh, Tocqueville said the art of being free is very difficult to learn, uh, but once you master it, uh, it changes the game. So this is not a book about how to be happy. It's not a book about how to get rich. It's not even a book about how to feel good. It's a book about how to be free, uh, and it, it requires friendship, and it requires an openness to rethinking uh, why it is that we're stuck with the things that make us so frantic and anxious all the time. Is this unique to America? It is, it is more unique than maybe we would think, uh, especially in an era of globalization, uh, especially at a time when um, equality in, in tastes and habits, uh, commercial equality, you know, everyone's starting to think around the world that maybe money is the measure of all things. Uh, feelings and sentiments like that, they are spreading around the world. It does make us feel as Americans maybe less exceptional. Uh, but if you, uh, if you hear what Tocqueville has to say, uh, what he suggests is the origins of the development of democracy in America uh, put us on a fundamentally different track from what's going on in much of the rest of the world. So we might have a lot in common and even more in common as you know, the global village uh, continues to, uh, to fill up the world. But there are important differences. Did Tocqueville like America? He did, although he was, he was worried, he was sad that the old ways were passing. This is 1830. Uh, yeah, but mostly sad because they proved themselves not to be as durable and as good as, uh, as the old aristocrats thought they were. So Tocqueville did not have any illusions about the old ways. He wasn't a reactionary. Uh, he, he saw the potential of democracy. He thought that democracy was part of the unfolding of a divine plan, um, and the collapse of the old way was part of that plan as well. But he also didn't have any illusions about how difficult it would be, especially in Europe and outside America, which, uh, which is being borne out right now, historically. What do you think he would think of today? Oh, would he be shocked? I don't think he'd be shocked. I think some of the, the technological developments would astound him. Uh, but I think the, the social change, the way that social changes have been developing, I don't think those things would surprise him. We'll continue the conversation with James Polis right after the break. You cover a lot of topics in this. Faith, money, sex, death, sex. Oh, yeah, there's lots of stuff in Democracy in America about sex. Uh, he was... One of the things that did astound him uh, was he saw how young American women, even quite young, you know, sort of mid to early teens, uh, were more or less constantly being uh, propositioned or approached in a, in a vaguely uncouth manner by the young men of the time. And uh, he was amazed that American girls were trained from an early age to be able to go out into society and sort of withstand these approaches, and even delighted a bit in, in toying with the, the boys, the men who came their way. Uh, you know, to what extent is that a politically correct you know, perspective today? That's a sort of an interesting question. Uh, but he did understand. Um, that sex was an, an integral part of, of social order and of social relations. And he was more uh, optimistic about how sex was going to uh, take shape as a force in American life than in Europe, where he said oftentimes much of the political unrest actually arises from, uh, from sort of unnatural envy and jealousy and, and unsatisfied desire uh, in home life. You write about money and you write about Trump in that chapter, do you not? That's right. Isn't Trump's driving force money? Well, Trump is, uh, Trump is the master of the art of the deal, as he likes to say. Um, that is not the art of being free. You know, if you, if, you want to, uh, if you want to bargain with people to your own advantage, um, take a look at the art of the deal or don't. You know, I'm not here to give investment advice. Mm. Um, but I will say that uh, bargaining is not the road to freedom, uh, not in your own life and not in our, in our shared lives together. Uh, Americans have the temptation to want to turn everything into a bargain. Um, there's no more American phrase than great deals, you know, that you can just see it whenever you walk outside your home or, or turn the top of the internet. Dealership. That's right. Not a great deal. <laughs> uh, great deals are fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with great deals. Uh, but they're not going to make us freer. Um, and people who throw themselves into the pursuit of bargaining 
uh, oftentimes think that that's one way of accessing greater freedom, and it turns out not to be. If they can hack us, if the GPS can follow us, can we be free? Well, there's always the option of turning it off, um, but it's it's a fact also. You can't turn it off if you have. Well, yeah, you could be like me and have a of a, a. I show you what I have. I defy all this. I cannot be hacked. Look at that thing. It's a phone. The flip phone. Can't be hacked. Right. So there, there are some ways of, of moderating your <laughs> footprint, your digital footprint. Uh, but there's no question that, that technology is expanding its way into society. And uh, it's going to continue to do so unless people start making some choices about where to direct that power. Uh, personally, I think that the best place to direct that power is into concrete things. Um, things like uh, uh, rockets to Mars or things like um, airplanes that can fly faster than they could in 1950. Um, those are the kind of advancements that don't point humans toward this sort of subhuman existence as kind of pampered pets that are completely wired into the internet on the one hand, or into like post-human quasi-godlike beings who might upload themselves into the cloud one day. I think it's important looking at technology and freedom to understand that being human is actually good. It's good news that we're human beings. Human beings are, are lovable, whether you look at that from a religious standpoint or not. Hmm. Uh, and that if we start to hate the human condition, then technology really will uh, take away our freedom. Uh, when de Tocqueville was writing, what was the average lifespan? Oh, it, it was not what it is today. Uh, it wasn't, uh, it, it depends. The, the differences around the world were starker than they are now. But uh, Tocqueville did have just this beautiful line in the book about how the short space of 60 years will never give human beings the opportunity to fulfill their longings. Uh, that mortality is, is um, a definitive part of the human condition, and we have to know going in uh, that there are going to be limits on our freedom. Uh, we can't have that. Now it's 60, freedom. now it's 80. That's true. However, um, much of the way that we prolong life today um, is sometimes reflective of a desire to merely prolong life. Uh, there are too many Americans, and too many people around the world who are not living particularly rich lives into their very old age. Uh, and I think that's a, a sad commentary on some of the ways that those few family links that have persisted over centuries are also beginning to come apart. People see a burden, they want to send grandma off to a yeah. home. Uh, there's got to be a better way there, too. Thank you so much, James. Great seeing you. Always a pleasure.